what is focus stacking and, and why would we want to do it? Now to understand why we might get into focus stacking, let's look at the problems with traditional single snapshot photography, something that's old, as old as photography itself. If we take a photo, a photograph, the result every time is that there is one primary focus point and focal plane in the photo. We can call it the camera's perspective or the point of view. And hopefully it's a photographer's point of view too, it's what, or the intent. Anyway, our eye is naturally drawn to that point in the photo because, because all of the rest of the photo, at least to some degree or another, is less focused, less in focus. If we want to have more of the entire photo in focus, we need to have greater depth of field. It's what it's called. And the standard way to get that greater depth of field is to narrow the aperture on the lens down. That is, use higher f-stop numbers. For example, if we typically shoot a photo at f5.6, and we need more depth of field to see more of the subject in focus at the same time, we can narrow that aperture to f8 or to f11. Correspondingly, if we want less of the entire photo in focus, we want just a razor edge part of something in focus, then we need to have less depth of field. And the way to get that is to open up the lens aperture and use lower f-stop numbers. For example, if we shoot a photo at f5.6 and we want less depth of field, we can open the aperture, aperture to f4 or even to f2.8. In this way, we can kind of dial in more or less depth of field. But no matter what we do, there will always be a single point of greatest focus in any photograph. And that focus point will be part of an entire plane of focus, like a wall of focus as well. But that entire plane is seldom in focus itself unless we use one of the special tilt-shift lenses, in which case by twisting and tilting the entire lens, we can bring that whole plane into focus. But mostly we only see that in copy cameras. Anyway, to repeat... In most photos that you and I have ever seen, the eye is drawn to that one point in the photo, which we could call the point of greatest focus. In fact, much of the tradition of photography up to date has been about having more or less depth of field in order to better define the viewpoint, the point of focus, and thus direct the eye of the viewer to where we want it. So if we want more depth of field, I think the obvious thought would be why not just narrow the aperture of the lens as far as we can until it's just a pinhole and have everything possible, at least for that lens, in focus. This is a great idea, but there's one main reason that it does not work, and it's a little term called diffraction. Diffraction is a law of nature, like gravity. And unfortunately, we don't break nature's laws. They break us. They control us. So diffraction is a physical property of how light rays, when they go through such a tiny hole, a tiny aperture, how, how light rays tend to actually bend and twist around the opening, resulting in an image that reaches the camera sensor in a degraded form. The smaller the aperture, like f-stop f16, f22, and higher, the more degradation until the sharpness of the photo just kind of becomes almost pixelated or fragmented. By narrowing the aperture, depth of field does increase like we hoped it would, but at the same time, more and more of the photo, the sharpness gets softer and softer until it has almost no contrast at all. So we get our depth of field, but at the same time, we lose all sense of sharpness in the photo. 
And as mentioned, diffraction is a law of nature, and no matter how many megapixels, no matter how sophisticated our camera is, it treats all cameras the same. Diffraction is extremely democratic. Anyway, the bottom line is that when your lens is wide open at, say, f1.4 f or f2.8, there is little to no diffraction because the light can just go right through the wide opening. But on most lenses, when they go beyond f8 or f11 or, and higher, diffraction increasingly takes its toll and diffraction is recorded as part of the image and it degrades the image. In other words, when a lens is used wide open, we have a very narrow depth of field, meaning just a small part of our subject is sharply in focus and the rest is increasingly blurred. And sometimes that's a beautiful effect. On the other hand, at high apertures, narrow apertures, we have a much deeper depth of field. We can see more and more of the subject in focus. But the higher we get, the degree of sharpness of that subject deteriorates accordingly until it just is not acceptable. So, we are, as they say, caught between the devil and the deep blue sea. And this is why most photographs are taken using aperture somewhere in the middle, with f5.6 typically cited as being the optimum aperture for obtaining both sharpness and a decent amount of depth of field. And leveraging one end of this equation against the other has pretty much been a constant struggle for photographers since photography first began. As mentioned earlier, in the traditional one-shot photo, there's a single point of greatest focus in the photo and one plane in which that focus point exists. But that plane itself is seldom exactly parallel to the sensor. Otherwise, everything would be in focus. For example, if we take a newspaper, tape it on the wall, and put our camera on a tripod exactly with the sensor exactly parallel to the wall and we take a photo, that resulting photo will not just have one point of focus. It will have all points of the same plane. The entire newspaper will be in focus. I mean, that's what copy camera is all about getting all points on the focal plane in focus at the same time. But this is a very special situation, and it's of use pretty much only in the, in the studio. Unless we are in a copy camera situation, the entire focal plane is not in focus. So we just have that one point of focus that we see in most photographs. Now, as mentioned earlier, photographers try to get around this problem by using fancy tilt and shift lenses, lenses that twist and turn until more of that focal plane is in focus. But this is kind of difficult to do and can only really be considered of use in when we do still life photos, where nothing moves. Trying to get the whole plane of a fast moving sports event would be almost impossible outside of sheer luck. So there you have the background you need to appreciate focus stacking. I'm sorry, sorry if it's a little technical, but it's a little technical. Focus stacking, at least at this point in history, is only workable on still life when the subject does not move. Although I've begun to experiment myself with stacking video, and somewhere in our future we may be able to eventually take hundreds of frames a second, each at a different focus point, and combine them into a single photo that stops motion with the result that a sports figure could be captured in full motion and, and have everything in the photo also in focus. We might not even like that, but we, sh we will be able to do it. It will happen. Now, focus stacking, which is what we're talking about here, it gets around the, the concept of diffraction and the problems of having a single focal point by taking a series of photos of an object, each in photo, each 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 layer in the series in focus, starting at the front of the object and gradually moving to the back of the object incrementally, and then combining the photo layers into a single photo that appears to be 
perfectly in focus or as much in focus as we want to have it be. And this is called focus stacking or stacking focus. Now focus stacking does at least two things. For one, it allows us to have as much depth of field as we wish in a photo. Like, that's like a dream come true. But it's also a clever way of at least apparently outwitting nature and getting around the law of diffraction. And there's more. Psychologically, focus does something else that I find interesting. Like in focus stacking, we actually liberate the way we view photos. Keep in mind that in traditional photos, the ones we've used all our lives, we are led by the photographer to look at the point of greatest focus. So our eye is naturally drawn to where we can best see the photo. However, in focus stacking, we can have everything in focus. So what does the eye do? What happens is that our attention is liberated and we are free to look wherever we want to look or just to look around in the photo. This new kind of freedom is what makes focus stacking so appealing to many. We decide what is the point of interest, what's the focus for us, and not the photographer or the camera. Anyway, this can be, if done properly, kind of a new and refreshing experience. Now, focus stacking can also be overused. A photo where everything is in focus looks like, well, it looks like a photo. Our eye can also get tired if everything is in focus, of having to figure out the point they're supposed to be looking at. We have to make up our own mind. Anyway, the real beauty of focus stacking is that it allows the photographer to have whatever parts of the image he or she wants in focus, including multiple focus points or even partial planes. And it lets the rest of the photo go to a nice blur, to what we call uh, bokeh. Now we can build or stack our focus based on whatever aperture of a particular lens is sharpest rather than constantly compromise between the extremes of having almost nothing in focus at wide apertures and the loss of sharpness I mentioned earlier due to diffraction when, when we get to narrow apertures. Focus stacking just avoids that entirely. So there you have a general idea of what focus stacking is. Photographing a series of layers of a subject, each of those layers in perfect photos, fo focus, and then combining those layers using software to build a single resulting image which appears to be entirely in focus, or as much in focus as we wish. Sound good? It did to me but there are also a lot of bumps along the road to focus stacking, and we're going we're gonna to get into some of them.